Hi, I am Joaquin van Schoren, and you are watching lecture two of our machine learning course, which is all about linear models. These are the simplest kinds of models, but they are super useful, and they also provide the basics of, of understanding, modeling, and optimization, and regularization. First, some notation and definitions, because we will look at quite a few formulas in this course. Uh, first, whenever you see a curly or italic letter x, that means it's scalar, it's just a number, like 3.24. If you see a bold letter x, that means it's a vector, it's a one-dimensional array of scalars. When we see x sub i, that denotes the ith element of the vector x, for instance, and it's zero-based, so x0 means 3.24. Some other courses use the subnotation like this, but we'll just stick to the subnotation. Whenever you see a curly letter S or a, a set of numbers with curly braces, that is a set. It means that these numbers are unique and unordered. A bold capital letter X, that means it's a matrix, which is an n-dimensional or a two-dimensional array of scalars. X sub i means the ith row of the matrix. X colon j denotes the j column of the matrix. And x sub i j denotes the element in the ith row in the j column. So whenever we see x one zero, it means row number one, that's this one, and column zero, it's this one. So we're looking at this value here. Now, matrices typically have a geometric interpretation. Whenever we have a matrix n times p, that means it has n rows and p columns, then this matrix represents n points in a p-dimensional space. According to some basis, but typically we, we talk about Euclidean space. For instance, this x here, uh, so the first element here is 3, 2, 4, and then 1, 2, so three, it's this one in here, so that's this point here. The second one, 2, 2, 4, and 0, 2 is this point here, and the third point, 3, 0, 6 is this one. Right? So this represents basically a data set consisting of three points in a two-dimensional space. A tensor is a k-dimensional array of data. So one-dimensional is a vector, two-dimensional is a matrix, but more generally, a k-dimensional array is called a tensor, which is denoted by an italic capital T. K is also called the order, or degree, or the rank. And whenever we see uh, italic T, I-G-K, it means it's the element of a tensor in the eight position in the first dimension, the j position in the second dimension, the k position in the third dimension, and so on. One typical example is a set of colored images. So whenever we have um, a, an image, this can be represented by a height and a width. So this image has a height and has a width. So every value here is a pixel. Uh, that image also has color channels, red, green, blue, and there are multiple images in the data set. This is then the fourth dimension. Right? We could also like uh, flatten this two-dimensional array as one vector, uh, but then of course we lose some of these uh, relationships between the values. So it's typically then represented as a four-dimensional tensor. Some basic operations, which you will often see. So, First, whenever we see a capital sigma, that means the sum. So capital sigma of xi means we take the sum of all the elements in that uh, vector x. Uh, a capital P means we take the product of all the elements of vector x. If we take the sum of two vectors, that is a, a new vector in which every value is a sum of the values of the corresponding uh, vectors. A dot product denoted by two bold um, letters, wx for instance, it's a dot product. You can also see this in the dot notation or the matrix notation, but we'll typically stick to the simple notation like this. 
this is a number. It's actually the element-wise product, like w0 times x0, w1 times x1, and then we sum up all these values, and that is a dot product. This has a very well-known geometric interpretation. For instance, if you have two points, uh, w and x, according to some basis, then the dot product is basically the projection of this w on x, like this, which means that this somehow tells us um, that the two points are close together. Right? So if two points are close together, the dot product will be large. If two points are far apart, then the dot product will be very small. Right? And this will be often uh, used in uh, this course, so remember this. Uh, whenever we have a product of a matrix and a vector, the result is a new matrix in which we take the product, the dot product, um, of every row in the matrix with that vector x. Whenever we have a function, it's noted like this. So it has input x and output y. Whenever the function has a minimum, that's any point C, where in some area around C, every other point is larger. That's a local minimum. Whenever there's no other point lower in the whole domain of the function, then this is called a global minimum. All right, so you can imagine some point here. This could be a local minimum. This is the global minimum. Some uh, functions are put the vectors. So whenever you see a fat uh, function f, it, it's a vector function which has as input a function a vector and it's also as output a vector. Then if we have a function x y which has a maximum, we notate the maximum like this. So this is the highest value, the value of x. Sorry, it means it's the highest point of this function f. So that's max. Arc max is the value of x, this point here, which corresponds to the highest value of function f. Now, a very important concept in this course are gradients. To explain gradients, let's first consider a function f and function of x. And say that this function is x squared. Looks like this. Then the derivative of this function tells us what, at each point x where this function is going down and by how much. Typically, we can compute this derivative using some basic rules. The derivatives of most basic functions are known, so we know that the derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x. So the derivative of x squared with respect to x is 2x. And so th this function basically tells us how this function is evolving. So x2 looks like this. So this tells us basically the slope of this function. So if you take a function a point here, the slope tells us that it's going down, and the gradient tells us, yes, this is indeed going down, because this is a negative. Like this could be like minus 2, for instance, here. Right, so this is going down. At this point here, it's going down a lot. right? So then you can say, OK, here. This could be like minus 10 a bit, okay? In the other direction, so here it's zero, with the gradient is zero, the function is stationary in that point. And on the other side here, the, the gradient goes up, so the gradient is positive, okay? Uh, function is, so whenever we have a more complex function, uh, for instance, a function where we have an outer function f and inner function g, then the derivative of this function is the derivative of the outer function times the derivative of the inner function. It's called a chain rule. It's very useful. 
Now, you say that the function is differentiable if it has a derivative in any point of its domain, so a function like this. At any point, we can compute the gradient, so this is differentiable. It's continuously differentiable if the derivative itself is a function, and if every derivative is also exists, then the function is smooth. Now, a gradient is basically the extension of this ID to multiple dimensions. So if you have, if x is a p-dimensional vector, then the gradient is a p-dimensional vector and every element basically tells us what the derivative is of the function according to a certain dimension, okay? So if you have, for instance, this function f, then um, first of all, the, we can compute the derivative of f with respect to x0, there's only one element which has x0, derivative of that is 2. So the first element of the gradient is 2. Derivative of f, according to the second dimension, x1, there's only one element with x1. The derivative of this is 3 times 2, that's 6 times x1, is this one. And finally, the derivative of f with respect to x2, uh, this is the derivative of sine, that's the cosine. So this will become minus cosine x2, right? So this tells us for every dimension, for every direction, basically, uh, how this function is changing. We can look at this also more geometrically. So say, for instance, we have this um, function f, which is minus x squared, x0 squared, x1 squared. So we have x0 and x1, we have two uh, dimensions. The gradient of this we can compute analytically. So the gradient of f with respect to x0, that's minus 2 times x0. With respect to x1, that's minus 2 times x1, like this. Right. This is the gradient. Now we can evaluate this gradient for every point in them. So say we look at the value minus 4, let's see. It's here and one. That's this point here. The corresponding value f. This is f uh, minus four one. Now the gradient tells us how much the function is changing at this point with respect to x zero and x one. So it tells us with respect to x one. So if you do minus four times minus two, that's eight. So this tells us that as x zero goes up, f goes up with a slope of eight, right? So if x zero goes up one unit, fx goes up eight units. In the direction of x two, x one, uh, we do one times minus two, that's two. So the gradient there is minus two, it tells us that as s x goes up, the function goes down with a slope of two. Okay. So this basically tells us in which direction the function is changing in, uh, sorry, in, by how much the function is changing in every direction. Right. If we rotate this figure, we can get a better view of that. So say we want to look at the gradient for x0, let's rotate this, right, so now we can see that as x0 goes up, f goes up by 8 times that amount, right, so this is a very steep slope, and as x goes up, function also goes up, that's the red line here. With respect to x1, we see that as x1 goes up, this function here actually goes down. The slope is minus 2, so this tells us that the function is going down the direction. And this will be very useful whenever we want to find the minimum of a function. Uh, for instance, in grade descent, it will tell us that um, if we compute the gradient, we can basically 
tell that, well, we should go down by a lot in this direction and also by a little bit in this direction. Right? This is the steepest way down that uh, surface. Finally, distributions and probabilities. Um, so we'll often encounter the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. So obviously you know what that looks like. It's a bell shape, which has mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. Um, whenever we have a random variable, this variable can be continuous or discrete. The, dis the probability distribution of a function f of a, of a continuous variable x is called the probability density function. This looks like this here. It's continuous. And whenever we want to know the expectation, that's the most likely value, so like 14, we can compute that by taking the integral of x times fx. If we have uh, a discrete variable, then Discrete, so it means there's only discrete values, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there's nothing in between. It can only have these integer values, for instance. Then for every value, we have probability. So the probability of having 5 is 0 0.2. The probability of having 3 is 0 0.08. Okay. Now, the expectation of this distribution, or the mean, is basically the weighted sum of all these probabilities um, times the value. Right? So it's a little bit times one, a little bit more times two, and so on. The mean will end up being somewhere here, like 5.5. .5. Right? 